Despite repeated efforts on his part, Horst Stark could not see any trace of the American units that were reported to have taken up positions on the opposite side of the river. But regardless of this, he had little doubt in his mind that they were there, shrouded in the darkness, silently returning his penetrating gaze, almost certainly assessing the defences he was standing amongst for the most likely point of vulnerability. To the north, the night sky was suddenly and violently illuminated by an incoming wave of enemy shellfire. The defenders on that section of the Rhine, clearly having done something to provoke the ire of the massed Allied forces they were facing. For too long now, the Heer had been unable to do anything to halt the three enemy armies that were advancing steadily across the German border. But tonight, there was the possibility that could change. His heart swelling with hope and pride, the SS Major signalled to his bodyguards before silently weaving his way back towards the nearby staging area. Some of the soldiers there immediately sprang up to their feet as he approached, quickly saluting. Yet just as many remained where they were, eyeing him with caution. But now was not the time for taking them to task. Having bypassed the supply and mess tents which these infantrymen were congregated around, Stark instead headed for a larger tent, one that had been carefully and deliberately set up, slightly away from the others. Acknowledging the salutes of the men who had been stationed there to prevent prying eyes, he swept in through the entrance, keen to discover how much of the work remained to be completed. He neither knew nor cared where they had managed to locate the tattoo artist. All that mattered was that they had, and that the old man had been persuaded to carry out the required task. The prisoner that was currently being worked upon showed little sign of discomfort. Instead, staring hopelessly down at the ground as the tattoo machine played back and forth across his exposed skin. Satisfied with what he saw, Stark moved on to the far side of the tent. There, several of his men were busily concealing the documents they had created into the lining of the greatcoats that the prisoners would be issued with. The colonel had been very clear with his instructions. The papers were to be hidden in the clothing so they would eventually be found by the Americans but not upon a cursory inspection. This operation would only be fruitful if the prisoners could pass through the enemy's front lines into the rear, with the writing remaining hidden inside their clothing until after that time. It still remained something of a mystery to Stark how a man from an aristocratic background like Graf von Stauheim had been able to court the higher echelons of the Nazi party. But the old man had repeatedly demonstrated a keen understanding of how to strike fear into the hearts of their enemies. A talent that had proven beneficial during his time in charge of the death squads on the Eastern Front. They had arrived there as conquerors, dispensing terror and death amongst the Russian people. Methods they had then gone on to use against elements of their own forces during the subsequent retreat. And now, they would be delivering the same level of fear and intimidation against the American forces massed against them, using a mechanism that no rational man could even hope to fathom the existence of. Eddie Guzan had just been settling down to eat when the messenger had arrived at the mess tent with orders for him to head over to the command post. Sighing in despair, the corporal rose and offered his meal to the other NCOs that had been seated alongside him before heading off after the orderly. This was the third time this week he'd been denied a hot meal, the growing number of deserters crossing the river, requiring his services as a translator in order for them to be evaluated and debriefed. As it turned out, Guzan's subsequent trip across to the CP had taken slightly longer than his masters had most likely intended, due to an unexpected encounter with the unit chaplain. Father Hegarty had flagged down the corporal as they had passed one another, cheerfully inquiring if he would be joining him for a drink later that evening. With a shrug of his shoulders, Guzan had cordially replied that he doubted it. But if by some miracle, tonight's detainees were relatively few in number, he would do his best to swing by the Padre's tent later. After a few more minutes' conversation, the priest had smiled and allowed him on his way 
leaving Guzan to double his pace in an effort to make up for lost time. Several minutes later, he arrived at the briefing tent to receive a stern dressing down from Lieutenant Maitland for the tardiness of his arrival. It had been relayed that a group of three deserters had been intercepted, trying to cross the Rhine in a small boat, before being brought into the camp for processing. All were Russian, apparently Hiwis, who had taken the opportunity to flee the units they had been assigned to, not one speaking a word of English. Each of the men had what appeared to be fresh tattoos upon their bodies, prompting fears that these could be signifiers of the werewolf programme, which the German propagandists had been crowing about of late. Although nothing of note had been found on them when they'd been detained, a more thorough search upon their arrival at the camp had found tight papers hidden in the lining of their clothes. Guzan was now to decipher the recovered documents, which were written in German. His translations would then be copied and handed off to the unit's intelligence officers, who would interrogate the prisoners. Accepting the sheaf of papers that had been thrust towards him, Guzan sighed heavily and then headed off to find a quiet space and a cup of coffee. It looked like it was going to be a long night. Settling down at one of the large map desks in the deserted briefing tent, Guzan started to work his way through the paperwork that had been seized from the prisoners. The first sheet he examined had seemed fairly mundane, largely made up of various written authorities for the drawing of ammunition and supplies. He had grimaced, however, when he came upon a section of text that seemed to have been buried in amongst the other paragraphs, which appeared to have been written in Latin. Trying to cast his mind back to his school days, he noted down what he thought were the words flame and extinguish, before moving on to finish the rest of the document. But on scanning through the second paper in the bundle, he soon found himself frowning once again. Here was the same Latin phrase, hidden away amongst several of the paragraphs, this time detailing patrol routes and timings. A quick inspection confirmed that of all the texts contained the same exact wording, tucked away amongst the other information, which it had no apparent business being alongside. Upon finishing translating the documents, the corporal suddenly realised that he may have found the perfect way to kill two birds with one stone and set off to find Father Hegarty. He spent the next few minutes threading his way through the sea of tightly packed tents that made up the rest of the camp, before arriving at the Padre's canvas abode. The old priest had beamed as the translator arrived at his tent, quickly producing two glasses and a bottle from his seemingly endless supply of bourbon. Accepting the drink, Guzan spread out the papers he'd translated on the nearby bed and then queried if Hegarty knew enough Latin to translate the recurring phrase. Putting on his glasses, the chaplain sat down and began to write, occasionally erasing and rewriting a section as his memory corrected him. When he finished, both men sat and stared with interest at what he had produced. And now, I summon forth a flame that shall smite all who stand before me and never extinguish. When asked what he thought it meant, Guzan shrugged, stating it could be some form of code or cipher which may make sense if matched up against a larger body of text. Then he thanked the father for the drink, apologising he could stay no longer, before setting off again back towards the CP and the waiting Maitland. Accepting the papers, the lieutenant had quickly scanned down through what Goosen had written, before dismissing the corporal, with a cutting comment about drinking, while still on duty. The two intel officers who'd been ordered to start the interrogations were about as excited at the prospect as Guzan had been. As a result, they'd been displaying little in the way of warmth as they stepped into the tent containing the first detainee. The Russian had looked up, seemingly quite content to be there, having been provided with a hot meal and also several cups of coffee since his arrival at the camp. Happily answering the questions put to him by his interrogators, the man had detailed how poorly supplied the German army was and how it would not be able to stand in the way of any sustained attack. Several minutes into the questioning, the papers found in his jacket had been presented to the prisoner and he had been asked about the Latin phrase hidden amidst the other writing. Initially, as he scanned through the papers, the man had shown little in the way of reaction, apparently having never seen them before. Eventually though, 
His eyes had come to rest on the section that had previously been written in Latin, since translated into his mother tongue by the diligent Guzan. Almost immediately, the unfortunate soul had suddenly screamed aloud, falling backwards against the canvas of the tent and clawing in agony at his face. The two American soldiers backed away as the prisoner continued to writhe and convulse, his shirt sleeves riding up to show the sigils that had recently been tattooed on his forearm, glowing vividly. Seconds later, his body suddenly burst into flame, a brilliant and beautiful green-toned fire that instantly travelled up and along the canvas it was touching, sending the whole tent alight. Several infantrymen stood nearby watched on in horror as the tent began to blaze, before two figures staggered out of it, both consumed by the same mysterious greenish flame. A horrified private had quickly slipped off his greatcoat, running over to the nearest officer and throwing it over him in an attempt to extinguish the fire, only for it too to catch a light. Moments later, the hapless GI himself was also ablaze, screaming and rolling around on the floor in agony as the fire took hold of his uniform. It took no time for more soldiers to come running, having equipped themselves with buckets of water as the fires now spread. But their efforts had no effect, the flames on the men continuing to rage despite their bodies having already been charred down to little more than glowing skeletons. A tent situated further at the line also suddenly blossomed into an eerily familiar green flame. The screams of the prisoner and the intel officers inside it joining the growing chorus of misery. As the chaos continued to unfold, the American soldiers arriving quickly formed into two partisan groups, those holding the others back for their own safety and those too desperate not to help. But for these brave souls, only death awaited, with the apocalyptic green flames, which could seemingly not be extinguished, transferring to them, as they frantically tried to assist the dead and the dying. Guzan had been laid out on his cot, on the verge of dozing off, when the torturous screaming had begun to sound out from the far side of the camp. Grabbing his rifle, he tumbled out through the tent flap, instantly colliding with another soldier who had emerged from the adjoining dwelling. As one, a growing mass of infantrymen had begun to make their way across the camp, desperate to find out what was causing the horrifying chorus they could now hear. Pushing through to the front of the crowd, Guzan tried to take in the sight of the bodies on the ground, the vehicles and the tents, all wildly ablaze. The flames they were producing gave off an eerie sound and a bizarre green light. As he watched on, a private sprinted out from amongst the crowd to the nearest victim, emptying an entire bucket of water over the writhing figure that lay at his feet. But as the fluid made contact with the flames, it had little effect, only for the dying man's arm to lash out moments later, catching the side of his saviour's leg, instantly setting the other soldier ablaze. There were cries of horror as the throng of GIs began to move backwards away from the carnage, slowly beginning to comprehend what it was they were dealing with. Then Guzan saw a familiar figure step forward, moving directly towards the danger. Father Hegarty, rosary in one hand, his Bible clutched tightly in the other. The corporal observed as the priest stepped towards two smouldering bodies and began to offer up prayers for their souls. The effect was instantaneous, the green flames continuing to diminish a little further as each new Latin blessing was issued. Eyes widening in comprehension, the old man hurried quickly towards the next victim, his words growing in confidence and volume as the flames there also started to die away. It would take the next hour, with Guzan and several others cautiously trailing behind the priest, covering over the remains of the fallen as he went about his grim and grisly business. The prayers he spoke in Latin seemed to somehow counteract whatever dark magic had been visited upon those who now lay dead and dying before him. The group that had been assembled at the command tent to discuss what had transpired was small. Maitland, a few of the other officers, the corporal and Father Hegarty. It was generally agreed now that when the text that Guzan had handed to the interrogators had been taken into the tents with the prisoners, the mysterious fires had broken out immediately after. This was seemingly confirmed by the only two intel officers who had survived, abandoning their debrief as the chaos in the adjoining tents had broken out. In consequence, they had not had time to show the papers to their detainee, the only one of the prisoners to have survived the torrid affair. As Maitland had been speaking aloud, 
trying to somehow ratify the link between the tattooed sigils and the text. Guzan's gaze had wandered, coming to rest upon the priest. Sat in the corner of the tent, visibly exhausted on both a physical and emotional level from the actions he had just been forced to take. Maitland's raised voice caused him to turn quickly, sheepishly asking the officer if he could repeat the question. Speaking slowly and carefully, the lieutenant asked if Guzan could produce several forged documents in a manner similar to those that had been found on the Russians. Documents written in English that would need to have the same phrase that had triggered the fires concealed deep within them. Slowly digesting the corporal's reply, the officer had then given orders for the surviving prisoner's markings to be photographed. There was a short pause, each of the assembled men expectantly awaiting further orders before the officer spoke again, asking if the sigils found on the prisoners could effectively be re recreated by the company medical officer using the instruments and tools he had available to him. Almost immediately, Hegarty had erupted in anger from his post in the corner, declaring if the lieutenant carried out what he was considering, it would amount to a crime against humanity. Maitland had quickly snapped back, such a crime had already been committed, and that the young American boys lying dead around their camp demanded justice for the cruel fate that had been visited upon them. Rising unsteadily to his feet, and angrily swatting away the hand offered by Guzan, the priest again spoke his mind, before walking quickly out from the tent into the night, wanting no part of what was about to take place. Dropping the sheaf of reports that had been returned from the forward positions situated up and down the riverbank, Stark scowled. Whilst two of the observation points had reported seeing a large fire amidst the American positions, there had been no indication of the chaos or significant withdrawals that the Major had hoped for. Reaching for his cigarette case, he stepped out into the falling darkness, reflecting on the apparent failure of their endeavour. The risk had been great, with nothing but death assured if the enemy managed to deduce the manner in which the attack had been visited upon them. And with an American breakthrough now almost certainly assured, it was time to withdraw his unit back to safer climbs. Returning and approaching NCO's salute with a wry smile, he offered the man a light, before inquiring if there had been any further sign of movement from the opposite bank. Taking a deep drag from his cigarette, the adjutant replied negatively, other than the unexpected arrival of a trio of SS men who had managed to escape their American captors. His eyes narrowing, Stark began to question the circumstances in which these men had arrived and what plans had been set in place to debrief them. He had listened on, as the three had claimed to have been subjected to a series of bizarre surgical procedures by a doctor in the enemy camp they had been held in, the guard left in charge of them apparently suffering some form of medical episode, allowing them to escape back to their own lines. Unable to shake the feeling that something was very wrong, Stark persisted in his questioning, inquiring about the nature of the injuries they had sustained and if any documentation had been found on the escapees. And it was as the corporal had nodded, stating the boat used by the prisoners had contained a briefcase full of enemy intelligence, then eerie and unfamiliar green glow had suddenly risen up from the river's edge, Stark's draw dropping in disbelief as the screams of the men there were transported out from the German lines, carried hauntingly away on the evening breeze.